Welcome to Keeping It Simple in SchoolNet 23. This is a self-paced course delivered via Nesis, Canvas, and Homebase. This video is also available on the NCDPI YouTube channel, so welcome to our viewers there as well. You may access the slide deck for this course using the bit.ly link that is on screen, on the Canvas page below this video, and in the YouTube video description. In this session, we'll cover what SchoolNet is, how teachers and students access SchoolNet, how teachers can create and administer tests, including a look at the redesigned test details page in SchoolNet 23, how students take their tests, and how teachers can review test results. Finally, we'll wrap up with a few additional resources to further your learning. If we haven't met yet, I'm John Mars, product manager for SchoolNet and a trainer for all home base applications here at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Thank you for joining me for my session. Let's talk first about what SchoolNet is. In short, SchoolNet is the statewide IIS, or Instructional Improvement System. North Carolina offers SchoolNet optionally to districts. SchoolNet contains thousands of standards-aligned resources across many content areas. At the end of the day, SchoolNet is largely all about tests. Teachers can create tests using ready-made test questions that are already aligned to North Carolina standards, or they can create their own questions. Once students have taken their test, teachers get a rich analytical report to identify student strengths and weaknesses and inform further classroom instruction. Before we dive into the actual system, let's take a quick look at the user interface just to get ourselves oriented. We're now logged in to the SchoolNet training site as a teacher. On the left, you'll notice the blue navigation bar that will allow you to navigate to various different modules within the system. You can click the blue down arrow next to any of these headings to find additional related options. At the top, the logo will always bring you back to the home page, and the little hamburger button at the very top left allows you to collapse the navigation window and gain some extra screen real estate. At the top right, you have the notifications bell. This will notify you anytime SchoolNet has something you need to know. The SchoolNet help button is available here, and the little user icon will allow you to sign out. The main page of SchoolNet is broken into various different modules. We'll focus on these larger modules over to the right. The first is called the Splash page. This is where NCDPI will post updates and news related to SchoolNet. Below that is the Choose a Section widget. The Choose a Section widget allows you to choose which class section you'd like to work with. Keep in mind that this is always synced from PowerSchool. Below that is the Classroom Assessment Monitor. This will give you quick at-a-glance information for the selected class section. For example, you can see that this class took this district or local test, they scored an average of 66.9% correct, and you can even see with the color bands how your class performed compared to the school and even the district if it's a district benchmark. You also have quick links over here to the various different reports that we'll take a look at a bit later. And if you scroll down within this widget, you can see the individual student results on this particular test. You can also use this drop-down to switch to a different test. And you can use the tabs along the top to see additional information. District and local tests will include any school or district benchmark that has been taken in SchoolNet. Classroom tests is where all of your My Classroom tests or teacher-created tests will live. Standardized tests will show you EOG or EOC scores for your students. And finally, test management allows you to manage current or previous assessments taken by this class. The last module is the classroom profile. This is basically just a student roster, but you can choose to view them by their roster names, by their grades, benchmark results, or student groups. You can also click on any student name to view their profile, which is a great way to find additional information about a student. Now that we've taken a look at the basic layout of the SchoolNet site, let's talk about accessing SchoolNet. To access the real version of SchoolNet, you'll log in to NC EdCloud. Please speak to your principal or data manager if you are not sure of your NC EdCloud login information. Once you're logged in, look for the red house icon to access SchoolNet. Students will also follow these same steps. 
If you'd like to follow along with me today, we do have a SchoolNet training site. The bit.ly link on screen will take you to the training site. We are using username teacher2800 with password home base. If you like, feel free to log in to the training site and follow along with me. You may also choose to log in to the real production version of SchoolNet, or you might want to just sit back and watch. Completely up to you. Now that we've looked at accessing SchoolNet, let's go ahead and get in there and create a test. So when we create a test in SchoolNet, you can use pre-created items that are already in the system, or you can create your own. Every test in SchoolNet is centered around the idea of standards mastery. And a test in SchoolNet can be within just one classroom, several classes, an entire school, an entire district, or even the entire state. If you want to create your own test items, you can do that when you're building a test or at any time. You can also create your own item banks to organize your items. There are many question types available from the basic multiple choice to fill in the blank to even a hotspot selection on top of an image. And you can embed media, calculators, and all sorts of other cool stuff. Now that we've talked about it, let's go ahead and do it. So we're back in the training site as a teacher. To get started, we'll expand the assessment section. You may be tempted to go ahead and click Create underneath the test heading, and that is certainly one way to create a test. But I really prefer to go find my questions first, so I'm going to come down to the second Find link under the Items, Rubrics, and Passages heading. Once you click on Find, you'll see that you can search by Items, or you can search by Passages, so my ELA teachers remember this option. For now, I'm just going to click on Find Items. and this will pop up the item search modal pane. Over on the left you have all of your filters. On the right, sort of in the main area, you've got the questions. So by default it's going to grab the subjects that we teach and the grade levels that we teach. You can click clear all filters at the top to clear that out. To get started, let's go ahead and select a subject of math. And we'll be fifth grade teachers today, why not? And then finally, you can select your standards. So we'll click Select Standards, and this will pop up the standard search pane. You'll notice at the top it's pre-filled my fifth grade. We'll select Mathematics. And now we can see all of the North Carolina 5th grade mathematics standards. We'll dig down into one of these and select a few standards to assess. And a good note is it's always best to select the lowest level standard. Over to the right of each standard you can see how many questions are out there aligned to that standard. And here on the far right you can see which standards you have selected. You can click the little trash can if you need to get rid of one. Once you're happy with your standard selection, click Save and Close, and you'll be returned to the item search pane. Now we're searching for items in fifth grade math that are aligned to one of these three standards. Down below that, we could also filter further and look at Webb's Depth of Knowledge or Bloom's or even Question Language. You can also click All Filters to get to a few additional filter options. So the same standard subject grade level, you can filter by item type. You can search for particular keywords, names, authors, publishers, the date it was added, the date it was last modified, uh, whether or not it can be exported, the language again, and you can even search based on some item statistics. So if you want to really get in deep um, in making your search very specific, there are a ton of options here. Once you've got them set the way you like, you'll just click Apply Filters down here, and you'll be returned again to the item search window. Now, if we were a math teacher and we were just ready to make our test, we could start checking off items here to the left of each item. You'll notice this checkbox. And unfortunately, my face is kind of in the way, but down here at the bottom left, it says One Item Selected. So that's where you can look to see how many questions you've selected. 
So we'll scroll through and just grab a few items here. And as we do that, it now says three items selected down here at the bottom. And you do have this nice unselect all button available. Now before we go on, let me shift gears a little bit and let's talk about ELA or possibly social studies as well. I'm going to go ahead and hit unselect all to unselect all questions. Let's shift gears just a little bit and clear all of our filters. So let's say now that we wanted to search by passage. Remember earlier we had that find items by passage option? You can also check this box at the top to find and group items by passage. This is the same thing as searching for passages on the previous screen. And once we've selected that, we can go ahead and fill in, let's do English language arts. And we'll do, let's say, ninth grade. And so now all of my questions are going to be grouped by passage over here on the right. So the first passage that came up is an excerpt from Lights in the Windows. It shows us the passage. We can hit view more to see the entire passage. And below that, it says we have 49 matching items that are linked to this passage. Now, if we just really liked this passage, we can hit select all and select all 49 of them. Or we can scroll through and just select a few that seem appropriate for us today. And if maybe two questions is enough, you can click this little arrow to collapse those items for this passage and continue on down to the next. So the next passage is about the Mayan codices. I think we'll skip that one for today. So the next one is disbelief. That sounds good. Let's grab a couple questions from there. So just like in the previous example, you can find your questions, you can apply all the same filters, but checking this box will group them by passage, which is great for ELA and some social studies courses as well. Now, once you've gotten all of your questions selected, you're happy with the number of questions you've selected, and you're ready to continue, down here at the bottom right of this pane is the Item Actions button. And under Item Actions, you'll click that and then choose Add to Test. And this brings you to the Add Items to a Test screen. You've selected four items, it says up here at the top, and from here we can either choose to create a new test with these items, or we can add it to a test that we've already started. In this case, we're going to create a new test with these items. And we're now at the Create Manual Test screen. You'll first want to give your test a descriptive name, and then you'll select your subject and grade level. We ended up with some ninth grade ELA questions, so that's what I'll go with. You'll then want to select which standards document you're using, in this case English Language Arts. And finally, you'll select your standards. And you don't necessarily have to select the standards here at this point, but it is highly recommended that you define which standards this test is actually looking at. So we'll just grab a few here, and we'll save and close. This works just like the standard search pane that we saw before when we were looking for questions. So we've now got our standards linked. Our test category is going to be My Classroom. Most teachers will only have the My Classroom option here. The other categories you could possibly see are school benchmarks or district benchmarks, and these would be tests that are used across a school or across a district, respectively. The rest of these settings really, for the most part, can be left at default. Um, we really don't need to get too far into the weeds here. Um, but feel free to, you know, sort of hover over this eye to learn more about the different score types and, and about the default fonts and, and what changing them can do. Coming on down, there are four categories of extra options that we'll peek at just briefly. Test item defaults, so this is going to override the settings on the questions that you have. So let's say that you really prefer that all multiple choice questions be laid out in one column, or maybe you like them in two columns, and you don't care what the question author said, you want it to display that way. You could use this feature to override that. 
Ditto for your answer choice positioning for gap match items, for your gridded answer entry, whether you want it to be a text box or a bubble grid, and finally, whether you want to enable tools and manipulatives. So maybe if you're creating a math test and you want to make sure that your kids will always have a five-function calculator on the whole test and you don't care what the question author says about it, you can use this to turn that on. You could also use this to turn it off. So you don't care if the item or the question author um, wanted them to have a calculator. You want it off. So you can turn that off here too. I'm going to leave all of these at the default, which is use item settings. So whatever the person who wrote the question said about it is what will come out on our test. The next category is test settings. Most of these can really be left at the default, but there are just a few that I want to draw your attention to. First of all, student comments. Um, I often like to turn on a comment at least at the end of the test, if not on each item. Sometimes kids will, you know, find that one of your questions is worded kind of strangely or, you know, they might just want to give feedback at the end of the test and this is a great way to collect that feedback all within one tool. And the other part is accommodations. Um, and this is important. So if this is an ELA test or even some math tests and some of the students in my class need accommodations like a magnifier or text-to-speech even, I have to turn on those options here. Now, turning on the magnifier here does not mean that every student who takes this test will get the magnifier as an option. Turning it on here means it's available on this test to students whose profiles indicate they get that accommodation. So, keep in mind, for a student to get an accommodation on a SchoolNet test, it has to be enabled in their student profile, and it has to be enabled here on the test. So in this case, I'm going to turn on all of my accommodations except for text-to-speech for passages. The rest of these, for the most part, can be left at default. Next up are my test restrictions. And this controls sort of what students can see before and after they take their test. So the default setting is no restrictions, and as you go down, they get more and more restrictive. So the next one is to hide correct answers always before the test end date or except for a particular date window. The next one would restrict access to the questions and the answer choices. And you have those same time options. You can also restrict their access to basically everything except for their final score. Or finally, the last option, hide from the student profile completely. This means that once your student submits that test, they will never see it again. They're not going to see their score, they're not going to see the name, they will never see the test in the system. So again, for my purposes, I'm just going to leave this on no restrictions. We're kind of building a simple classroom quick check sort of test. And finally, we have co-authoring settings. Co-authoring is an awesomely powerful feature in SchoolNet that allows you to work with other teachers across your school, district, or even the state. I talk about co-authoring in another one of my SchoolNet self-paced courses, so be sure to search Nesis for collaboration in SchoolNet if you're interested. For now, I'll just leave this turned off. Once we're happy with all of our settings, we'll hit Generate Test. So now our test has been generated, and by default we're dropped into the test editing interface. So this would allow us to make changes to these questions if we wanted to, maybe if we wanted the correct answer to be worth two points on this question or uh, something like that. Maybe we noticed a typo we want to fix real quick. Um, you can navigate through the different questions over here on the left. You can also add additional items here. Um, so if you hit add item, you can search from the item bank, and this will take you back to that same item search interface we were looking at before. Or you can create your own question right from here. In this case, we're pretty happy with the way the test questions were in the item banks, so we're just going to keep them as is. I'm going to change this back to one point for the correct answer, and we'll just hit return to desk details up here at the top right. And we will save our changes. So this brings us to the test detail screen. And this is sort of the main screen you'll use to work with your test once it's been created. If you are an 
old time user of Schoolnet, you've been familiar with it in the past, you'll notice that this screen looks very different this year. This screen has been completely redesigned to make it easier to use. So at the top right, you have the various test stages. So the first stage is draft, then finalized, and then finally scheduling. And then we go on to some additional stages beyond scheduled. Up here at the top, it gives you the name, the test ID, and this is very helpful if you are reaching out for help with one of your tests that you've created. Often our support agents will ask for the ID, so that is now right here. You can also quickly see what type of test it is, the subject, the grade level, who created it. You can add items right from here. You can edit the items. You can preview the test as a student. The finalized test option, this will move it along to the next stage, which is finalized. And finally, you've got this little hamburger menu over here to copy or delete the test. Down here at the bottom, this is sort of divided into tabs. So the item summary just gives you a quick glance at the items that are on your test. So we have four multiple choice items with sort of a range of difficulties. Um, the correct responses are listed. The number of points are listed here. You can add instructions for your students here and customize things. And you can kind of work with individual questions here, view it, edit it, remove it from the test, replace it with another one that kind of thing. The item details tab sort of shows you the same thing except now you can see the passages and the items. Um, and you again get these same hamburger menus that allow you to view, edit, replace, remove, turn off the timer, whatever you may want to do there. The test settings tab, this gets you back into those settings that we were looking at a moment ago. Um, so if you suddenly realized, oh, I actually wanted to change this or that setting, you can always come into the settings here and find the one you're looking for. You'll hit edit and you can change that. This is also where you can customize your score groups and your color coding um, and as well as enable your accommodations. And the last tab is the downloads and resources tab. So this is where you could download your test booklet, your answer key, your cover sheet, or you could add maybe a, a resource that you might want to give to another teacher who's administering this test. So we're pretty happy with this. Um, we don't really need to do any further review. So I'm going to go ahead and promote this test to the next stage. So this pops up and tells us, are we sure we want to finalize? You will no longer be able to make changes to the test. Do you want to proceed? Yes, we're happy with our questions. We're good to go. So the test is now in the finalized stage, and it would be at this point that you would want to go ahead and generate your text-to-speech using this button here. And you'll notice up here at the top right, it tells us that text-to-speech is being generated, and we will receive a notification when it's finished. So that's awesome. We'll let that roll in the background. You'll notice that this button up here has now changed to just modify items. You can still modify items at this point, um, but it, it's just kind of not recommended to um, once your test has been finalized. But if you were to notice a last minute issue, you could still correct it at this point by clicking modify items. So we will wait for the text to speech to generate and then we'll preview this test real fast. Um, it's also highly recommended that you preview the test at this point just to make sure that things like text to speech are working right, make sure all the questions are showing up the way you expect. All right, so we can now see that we have a red one up here next to the notification bell at the top right. So this tells us that text to speech conversion has completed. And we do get a quick link here to go to the test details page for this test. Of course, we're already there in this case, but if you weren't there, um, you can navigate away while text-to-speech is being generated, work on other stuff, and come back. But now that it's ready, it tells us text-to-speech content is ready here, and we can preview the test as a student. So I'll go ahead and click that, and it will launch TestNav. So this is the same exact interface that our students will see. And we can go through and just preview everything, make sure it works right, make sure the text-to-speech works correctly. This little play button over here will play it. According to the passage, how are India and Bangladesh similar? 
That sounds great. So we would continue through and review the rest of the questions. As we go, if we want to answer the questions, we can do that. And we can even calculate the score. So maybe if you were doing some interesting things with your point values, um, you could calculate your score just to test that. If everything looks good, and in this case it does, we will close out of that new window it opened and come back to our test details page. Since everything is good, we're ready to go ahead and schedule this test. Now I do want to point out you still have your copy and delete options over here under the hamburger menu. So we'll go ahead and schedule this, and this will bring us to the schedule a test screen. And again, if you are a longtime user of SchoolNet, you'll notice that this looks pretty much the same as it always has. So the first thing you'll need to fill in is your administration dates. So what is the first date students will be taking this test? I'll just say next week. What is the last day students will be taking this test? So maybe a week after that. And then finally, what is the score due date? So what is the absolute last day that you will be scoring anything on this test? This is the date that the additional item statistics will be generated. Um, so after this date, you really don't want to enter any more scores. So just keep that in mind as you select your dates. The next three options have to do with the test results and scoring. You can prevent students from launching the test before the start date or after the end date. You can prevent students from accessing their results until after the end date. And you can prevent other teachers from scanning answer sheets after the score due date. Typically, for a classroom assessment, I'll say just leave all three of these unchecked, but certainly if you were maybe having trouble with students accessing tests outside the window, you could turn on the option to prevent them from launching it. The next section is the assignment for your students, and this part is very important, especially if you're going to be using this test with PowerTeacher Pro. Um, and my apologies, I should mention that in the production real version of SchoolNet, you'll actually have a fourth box under the test results and scoring heading that will say sync grade to PowerTeacher Pro. Checking that box will allow SchoolNet to sync this grade directly into your PowerTeacher Pro gradebook, provided it has been assigned to one of your class sections. So we'll go ahead and hit select assignment. And now we can either assign it to one or more of our class sections, or we can assign it to individual students. So if we flip over to the individual students tab, we can select one of the sections and hit go to filter the student list. We could start checking off the students we want to take this test and hit add selected. Or we can just assign it to the entire section. So in this case, I'm going to flip this back to assign to sections, and it does warn us that we'll lose those student selections if we choose a different method, but that's fine. So we'll flip back to assign to sections, and I'm just going to assign it to all of my English 4 classes, let's say. So we've got those selected. We'll go ahead and hit save, and that will bring us back to the test details page. So now we've got our administration settings set up. We've got our dates input. We've selected our class sections that will be taking this test. Now the last part is our online delivery options. And probably the most important option here is the online test passcode. Now the passcode is what you'll actually give your students to take the test. Students will take this passcode and they will type it in on their end and hit start test. So it will auto generate a passcode for you but you may also choose to customize this passcode. So maybe I want it to be my last name one for the first test that I'm giving this year, something like that. The rest of these settings typically can be left at the default, um, but a few I'll point out is allow only assigned students to take the test. So maybe if you're having trouble with students sharing passcodes and some kids are taking tests that they don't really need to, you could turn on this option and that would prevent students that aren't in those assigned classes from taking it. You could also restrict the test access to specific days and times, maybe if you only want your students taking it during the school day on a school day. The next few options have to do with the item features. 
Um, and these are usually worth reviewing. I do always recommend that you turn on the track and display student response time option. That will allow you to see later how long each student took on each question. Um, and this is a great way to kind of help diagnose student performance. Um, you know, maybe a kid performed more poorly than you expected, um, but if you have this option turned on, you can go in and see, well, maybe they only spent five seconds on each question, so maybe they didn't really take the test, right? Um, your other options here are to scramble the question order and scramble the answer choices. These are great, especially if you are in person in a classroom and maybe you're a little tight on space, so you want to make sure every kid's not seeing the same question at the same time with the same answers in the same order. The final few options here are your student-facing features. So you can choose to time the test. Maybe you only want them to have 60 minutes to take it. Um, you can also choose whether or not students are able to resume a test that has been paused or exited on their own, and whether or not students can pause the test on their own. And finally, whether or not the system should show students their scores as soon as they submit the test. So with this option turned on, as soon as your student hits submit, they're going to see their score. And for most tests that are computer scorable, so that is multiple choice, true, false, hotspot, most of those more typical question types, um, the system can score those immediately and show students their scores. But keep in mind that if you have any questions that have to be manually graded, so your open response items, SchoolNet is going to count those as a zero until you've graded them. So if you have a test with a lot of open response on it, you might choose to turn this show student scores option off because they're going to see artificially low scores. In our case today, since it's just a multiple choice test, I'm just going to leave that turned on. So really the only thing we changed in here was to track and display student response time and we customized our passcode. Once we're happy with all of these settings, we are almost ready to go. I also want to draw your attention to this set these options as my personal template. So if you're making a lot of school net assessments and you find yourself always switching the same options on this screen, you can check this box and this will sort of save all of these settings as your defaults. So next time you come to create a test, you won't have to turn on the track and display student response time. It'll just load it in from your personal template. I'm going to leave that unchecked for myself today, and I'm going to go ahead and hit Save and Publish. Um, we are all good with all of our settings, so we're ready to publish this test. So now you'll notice a few things. First of all, at the top right, it tells us that this test is being published to TestNav. We'll be notified here when it's finished. The test does have to get fully published before your students can take it. You'll also notice back here on the test details screen that our stages have kind of changed here, right? So this is now in the scheduled stage. Once we get past the start date, it will move to the in progress stage. And once we're past the end date and the score due date, it will move into the completed stage. You still have the test ID up here at the top in case you're having trouble and you need to contact support and they ask you for that test ID, that is right there. And now that we've set our passcode, it also shows you the online passcode right here in bold. So you can very quickly find that passcode again to give out to your students. As I've talked, we have completed publishing. So you notice you get this red notification bell again telling us that our test has been successfully published to TestNav. We can always come in here and review our schedule. If we needed to edit our dates, we could do that here. If we needed to view our assignments or edit the assignments, we could do that here. Um, I'll also mention that if you have PowerTeacher Pro grade passback turned on, you're syncing this grade back to your PowerTeacher Pro gradebook, you would see information about that down here. It would tell you the last date it tried to update this grade in your gradebook, and you would have options to select which assignment category you wanted in over on the Power Teacher Pro side, um, and there's a button to update the scores in Power Teacher Pro, so those options would live kind of right here under assignment. And the rest of this page is pretty much the same. You've still got your item summary, details, all of that good stuff. Um, you can still view and even modify a question if you need to. Now keep in mind you really shouldn't modify your questions at this point especially if a student has already taken the test. 
Um, it, it can have some odd effects. But if you haven't given the test yet and you just last minute noticed a typo or something like that, you could still fix it. Keep in mind, though, that you'll have to wait for it to republish to TestNav if you make a change like that. Otherwise, we are ready to go ahead and give this test to our students using this passcode. So we've created our test, we've published it, we've scheduled it, and now it is our first test day. So we've come back to our test details page. Now you'll notice this test is now in progress because we're on the start date. And otherwise, the rest of our screen looks pretty much the same. We've still got the item summaries, we've still got the details here, but you'll notice a new section has been added to this white bar called Test Collection. So this is telling us zero of our 89 students have taken the test. We can jump into the data collection report here, which would kind of show us a, a per section sort of view. So we have 32 in this class eligible for testing. None of them have done it. So the collection status is not started. Keep in mind that's there, but I'll jump back. You'll also notice this new link here that takes you directly to your Proctor dashboard. So the Proctor dashboard is pretty much the same as it was in prior versions of SchoolNet, but this is where that link lives now. And you'll only see it once the test is in progress. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Proctor dashboard um, because we are ready to give this test. So this is a great way to kind of track your class's progress as they take their test. And up here at the top, we've got the name of the test. We've got the ID real quick. If we maybe have an issue and we need to give this ID out, it's right here for us. And we also have a reminder of our online passcode. We can also select which section we want to view this Proctor dashboard for. So if multiple classes are taking this test, I can switch classes right up here. Below that, it's going to give us, again, our number of not started, in progress, and completed students. And below that is our student roster. And so you'll notice it has a test progress bar. So this bar will actually fill up as students take the test, red or green if they're getting it right or wrong. Once the student submits their test, I'll immediately see their score right here, and I can always see their status. If a student happens to close out of their test for some reason, or it pauses, or they have device trouble and they get kicked out, you'll notice that there will be a resume link right here for any student that is in progress and has been booted out of the test. So you can always hit resume here to allow a student to open their test again. And if you do that, the system will remember the answers they've already submitted and hit next on. So it will kind of pick up where they left off. So let's go ahead and log in as a student and see what this would look like for them. So I'll go ahead and grab my online passcode and we can just imagine I'm writing it up on the board or something like that. I'll instruct my students to go to NC Ed Cloud. They'll pop in their UID and their password just like usual. They'll hit go and then they'll hit the red SchoolNet house icon. And once my students sign in, their page will look something like this. So very similar to the teacher page, just with completely different options, right? So what the students are looking for is the take a test widget. And they will take the passcode that I gave them, type it in, and they'll hit go. Once students enter their passcode, they may get this class selection drop down here. So occasionally it will be a little confused about which class they're taking this test in. So students should just make sure that they pick the class that they're taking the test in. It should usually default to the right one, but it's always worth checking. And once they've gotten their class selected, they'll hit start your test. And this is a good time to point out that they have to allow pop-ups to start a SchoolNet test. So I will just allow pop-ups here. And now you can see students get a very similar view to the one that we saw when we previewed the test, right? Um, but this is what it really looks like for a student to take a test. So we'll go ahead and start test now. And we can read through our passage. We can maybe highlight something that seems interesting to us or seems like it might be important later. Along the top, I do have an answer eliminator, so maybe I'm a kid that likes to X out questions I know are wrong. Maybe I want to take some notes about it as I read my passage. And once I'm ready, I can go ahead and select my answer. 
and then I'll hit this blue next button. And as I go through, I get this next passage, I can answer. And you'll notice this is now a question about the first passage and it saved my highlights. Keep in mind too though, if you're giving an ELA test, you might not want to scramble your questions because that will scramble your passages too. So I've now answered all the questions. When I hit next, it's going to take me to the review screen. So it'll tell me if there are any questions I didn't answer or maybe if I bookmarked a question. Um, and I, I should have shown you there is this bookmark button up here. So if you have a student that likes to mark the questions they don't know and come back to them, they can bookmark. They also get this review button where they can jump between different questions. So now it shows us we have one bookmark. Um, since we did turn on student comments, they get the opportunity to enter a comment here as well. Um, and they do still have this review option where they can go back to other questions. They maybe want to review this one they bookmarked. Once your students are happy and good to go, they can hit submit final answers. Once they hit submit final answers, they are done unless you reopen the test for them. So in this case, I clearly did not do very well. Maybe I didn't read our questions close, closely enough. But this is what a student would see. Once they get their score, they'll close this window and it will just kind of take them out. Going back to the teacher view, we'll go ahead and refresh our Proctor dashboard so we can see we have one, two, three, and four red segments. Our students scored 0% but they are completed. Now, if this student maybe hit submit accidentally, um, we could always hit resume here, and that would allow them to reopen the test and change their answers. And we would see the same thing for our other students as they go through the test. And the bar will kind of gradually fill up as they go along if they're taking an appropriate amount of time. So we've seen how a teacher can create a test and administer a test. We've also taken a look at what it looks like for a student to take a test. So let's talk about what's next, reviewing those results. So once my students have taken their tests, I can go back out to my SchoolNet homepage and I can see their data in two places really. I can use my homepage and flip to the classroom test tab and this will show me quick data about all the classroom tests these students have taken. So in this case, we see my SchoolNet 23 training. I've only had one student take it so far. They scored a 0% correct, so that's not too good. We can also click this, and if there were other tests my students have taken, I could switch to those as well. I'm going to switch back to the district and local test tab just to give you a little bit better view of a test with some actual data, though. Um, but you'll note that these two tabs actually work the exact same way. So back on the district and local test tab, we again have our test selected. We can see the average percent correct. We can see our score group comparisons here. Again, you can scroll down and see the individual student results. But I want to draw your attention to these pre-formatted reports. So these links over here will take you to kind of the, the six main reports that you're going to look at. So this is one way to get to these various reports. The other way to get there is to expand your reporting category over on the left and go to the reporting dashboard. And when we go to the reporting dashboard, we're going to get a list of all the tests that the selected class has taken. And you can change the class you're looking at up here at the top. And if you have multiple sections, maybe you want to see all sections of your English for Honors. So you can view it by course rather than section as well. I'm going to go ahead and select the second assessment here. And if you just click on the assessment name, it's going to take you straight into the test summary report. And you'll notice these tabs along the top have the exact same titles as those quick links back on the home page. So this is how you get to the individual test reports. So the test summary report is going to give you a more detailed graphical view of your overall class performance. So in this case, uh, my students got an average of 66.9% on this test. 
74.2% of my students are considered proficient. And then this score groups table kind of breaks that down. So two of my students scored in the 90 to 100 range, eight in the 80 to 89 range on down. 23 total students were considered proficient, so that's a score over 60. And then I have eight of my students who were considered not proficient and broken into these various score groups. Over here to the right, you can export the student response report, which kind of gives you a report of the student responses. You can also export this actual report to a PDF. So maybe if you want to review your results on paper later on in a PLC or with leadership, something like that, you can always export it. And you also have this nice link to take you to that collection report we saw a little bit earlier. So if you're worried that, you know, not all of your students have taken this test, you can always look at the collection report to see what's up with that. Scrolling on down, at the bottom of this report, we can view the performance comparison by student, subgroup, or standard. So the student view is going to list all of our students, their score, whether or not they were proficient, and their score group. You can click on any of these column headings to sort by that heading. So maybe I want to sort by score groups, and maybe I want to group my students based on their scores. So I could throw these kids in a group and have them work on an enrichment activity. I could grab these kids and have them just do some extra practice. And then maybe these kids need some reteaching one-on-one -on -one with me. So that's a quick and easy way to use this report and put these results into action. You can also view it by subgroup, so if you want to know how male versus female students compared, or maybe you want to get into the race, you can view the average score by each of these subgroups, and you get the nice little graph again by subgroup. And you can mouse over that graph to see all of the details there. And you can also view the comparison by standard. So this is going to list all of the standards that were assessed on this assessment, how many questions were toward each standard, and the average score for the questions on that standard. So in this case, I can pretty quickly see that my students are pretty strong in these two standards, but they maybe need some more support in these standards at the top and the bottom. And I can always mouse over to see the full text of that standard. And over here, this little M, will actually allow me to go search for related instructional materials that are aligned to this standard. The next report we'll look at is the standards analysis report. So this kind of dives into the standards that were assessed on this test. So at the top we get results by standard for this section we have selected and we see each standard as its own bar and it is showing us the average score on that standard. And again, you can mouse over to see the full standard text and the average score for that standard. And just like before, down here at the bottom, we get these individual student results. This time we see each student's overall score and then their score for each standard based on the questions aligned to that standard. And you also get section level totals and if this is a school or district benchmark, and in this case it is a district benchmark, we can also see overall statistics for the school and for the district. So you can compare how your sections perform next to each other, next to the school, next to the district. And you can always scroll down to get more. And keep in mind, you can click on any of these student names to get into their profile. And you again have the view by student or subgroup option here if you are interested in viewing this by subgroup. If you're really into data, you can also export this particular report to Excel. So you can kind of start building your own tables and, and charts and things like that um, if you are someone that really likes data. The next report is the student analysis report. And I personally don't find this report to be terribly useful, um, but it is here. You can export it to Excel. It's going to show you the student name. It will show you their race, and you can filter that if you like. It will show you their percentage correct, their raw score, and their score group. And again, you can filter any of these. You can sort by any of these. Um, you will notice there is a special education status column but this data is not populated in SchoolNet for North Carolina. So keep that in mind. 
you can hide and show some of these columns. So maybe if I don't want to even see that special ed status, I could hide that. And then I can export the data I see here to Excel. Um, this is also a, an easy way if maybe I want to grab a couple of these kids and create a student group. I could do that. Um, but other than that, I, I, I've never felt like this report really shows you anything that the other reports don't. Next up is item analysis. So this is a report I do like a lot. Um, so where the first report was just sort of our overall summary, our second report dove into the standards in more detail, student analysis dove into the students in more detail, this is going to dive into individual test items or questions in more detail. And this report does typically take a moment to generate, but it has a lot of great data, um, so it is usually worth the wait. You'll notice that your columns at the top are for each item on the test, each question on the test. And our first row is the section-wide percentage correct, so our section as a total had a total score of 66.9%. We saw that statistic earlier. But now we can see their percent correct by each item, we can see which primary standard that item was aligned to. We can see the point value, and we can see the correct answer. You can also show all alignments if a question is aligned to more than one standard. So for example, these first three questions are actually aligned to two standards. You can also expand the section-wide percent correct to see the school or district-wide statistics. Again, if this is a school or district benchmark. And keep in mind that these are those extra statistics that it calculates after the score due date. So just a few details to keep in mind. Scrolling on down, just like on the other reports, we now get into the individual student results. So again, we've got our first student here with their total score. On the first question, they got this incorrect. We can tell because it is in red. This student answered B. The correct answer was D and they spent two minutes and nine seconds on that question. So this is where that track and display student response time comes in, right? Second and third questions they got right. That's the amount of time they spent on them. And you can see on for each question on the test. So now we can really dig in. Um, so item six, my section wide percent correct on item six was 32.3%. So my class really didn't do very well with this question. And I can also see that the school wide got 30.8% and district wide was 24%. So what's up with this question? Well, let's go down and see. So let's sort by the answer on this question. So four of our students answered B, the correct answer was A. Four of our kids answered B. Most of our kids, it looks like, answered C. We have a couple Ds here, and then we have our handful that answered it correctly, right? We can see how much time they all spent. But our most common incorrect answer is C. And, well, what was this item? You can click on the item link up here at the top. And that will actually show you the item. So in this case, it is attached to a passage. There's the passage. And here is the question. That's the correct answer. It looks like, actually, across the board, our most common error is C. So we might want to review this question, or if it's a school or district benchmark, maybe bring it to our school and district um, test creator people, right? and see if maybe this question should be reworded or something, or if it's just truly a difficult question um, that we can spend a little bit more time on. Um, and it gives you all of the additional properties and details about this question. So I'm going to jump back to the item analysis report. That link was back up at the top left of that those item details. Um, so as you can see, this is a very powerful way to start digging in and, and seeing more specifically, you know, was this a question that my students just didn't perform well on because it was a hard question? Was there a typo in the question? Something like that. Um, this is a great way to start diagnosing that. And you can export this report as well to a PDF 
or you can export all of this data into an Excel spreadsheet. So if you're, again, someone that loves data, you've got those powerful export options. Next up is the standards mastery report. So this is going to show us sort of a summary view of our student's standards mastery on this test. So these are all the standards that were assessed, and you get the full standard text. It tells us how many que test questions were aligned to that standard. And then it tells us how many students scored in each score group. And I can even see how many times this standard has been assessed in this school year. And you can click on any of these numbers to get extra information. So maybe I want to know who these 14 kids are who did very poorly on this standard. I can click on that 14, and now I see these are the kids that did well, these are the kids that did very poorly, and this kid probably didn't take the test yet. So I'll jump back to my previous page. And you can also click on maybe the times assessed link. Well, you know, maybe I don't remember assessing the standard three times. So let's see, okay, these were the three times it was assessed, and these were the dates it was assessed. So we can kind of see, you know, the history of the standard this school year. And I'll point out you can export this report to a PDF as well. You can also view it by section average instead of score groups. So this is just going to show you your overall section average on each of those standards, and you still get the number of times assessed. Next up is trends. So the trends report is one way that you can kind of view the trends of your class throughout the year. So if they are taking benchmarks or, or something like that, you can choose a handful of benchmarks to kind of look at and see what the trends are. So I'll just select two more random tests here and we'll hit go. And so this is going to show me for test one, test two, test three, I guess test two is not aligned. But for test one and test two, we can compare the performance on the standards that were assessed. And the last report is our summary statistics. So this is just sort of a summary of all the different statistics on this test. So for each student, you'll get the student, their raw score, percent, score group, whether or not it considered them proficient, what their percentile was on this test, what their quartile was on this test. So those are kind of all of the pre-canned reports. And hopefully this has been a good overview of the various reports. But before we move on to the final section, I want to show you one more reporting trick. So I'm going to go back out to my reporting dashboard. And there is a newer type of report. It's similar to trends, only I would say better. Um, and that's called the assessment comparison report. So when you're out here on the main reporting dashboard, you may have noticed there's a checkbox next to all of these tests. So I can select up to 10 tests here and compare them side by side. So we'll just grab these four. I'm not selecting them with any real strategy, just randomly grabbing some. And down here at the bottom, once we have multiple assessments selected, you can hit Compare Assessments. And once you do that, it pops up sort of the report option. So it's telling us we're going to look at these four assessments. We can hit the trash can over here to get rid of one. We can hit Add right here to find a new one and add it. We can change the sort. I'm just going to leave it on the default of old to new. We can also select which data we want to look at. So maybe I don't really care about their raw score, so I'm going to uncheck that. And maybe I don't really care about the average score either, so I could uncheck that. Um, and I could even add additional data elements. So maybe if I want to see student absences, next to all of this. I could add absence on there. Once you've got all of these settings kind of the way you like, you can hit generate report down here at the bottom right. And that will generate your assessment comparison report. So this report has two tabs, the performance comparison and the standards comparison. So the performance comparison is kind of just comparing overall performance on the test, right? So each test has its own column and I can mouse over and see the details, the average district score, the school score, and my section, the number of items, how many students took the test in my class, 
and I can mouse over each of these to get that same data. But now I can see side by side how the average score compares. I can also flip over to stu percentage of students proficient and even the score groups if I want to see those divided out columns. So in this case, I can see that really my students kind of did the best on the first test here. So that's maybe interesting. Might be something I want to dig into. Down below that, just on like on the other reports, you get your individual student listings. You can see how many absences they had because we had absences added to our report. And for each test, we see their score, their proficiency, yes or no, and their score group. So these were those statistics we chose to include on the report earlier. And again, you can click on any student name to view their profile. You can use these filters to filter. Maybe I only want to see students who scored between 20 and 40%. I could put that in and hit filter. And now I'm only seeing those students who scored between those specific numbers. Going back up to the top, we can also look at this by standards comparison. So I'll flip over to standards comparison. And so now this is going to show me the standards that were assessed. In this case, we're looking at standard level one. So let's go down a level. So we can see L6 was only assessed once. L5 was only once. L4 was assessed on all three assessments. So we can see how student performance compared across those three assessments for this particular standard. And again, I can scroll down and see the same information in a table. I can expand my table down and get into the weeds here and really get all the details. Um, you also have this nice little graph button here that will show you a graph of just that particular assessment or standard. Before I leave you, I wanted to point out a few additional resources that may help further your learning. All of these links on the slide deck are live, and this slide deck will remain available to you permanently. The first link there will take you to the DPI SchoolNet training site, which is always available to you if you need to play with SchoolNet and just figure out how something works. The DPI SchoolNet Google site is the home of all NC DPI SchoolNet training resources. The DPI School Night Courses link will take you to the Courses page of the Google site, and this is where you can find out about current and upcoming self-paced School Night courses in Nesis. The DPI School Night Videos link will take you to the School Night playlist on the NCDPI YouTube channel, and this is where I post all recorded School Night trainings that I do here at DPI. The next five links will take you to various quick reference documents, or QRDs, and these are great ways to refresh your memory on how to do something or maybe even learn something new. These are the QRDs I thought you might find most helpful at this point after watching this video, but there are many more posted on the DPI SchoolNet Google site as well. And with that, I thank you for joining me for this course. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I hope this has been a good overview, refresher, or even introduction to SchoolNet. Have a great school year.